Business coach and author Manuel Palachuk is here to talk about news from Pulseway, as well as breaking into new technology with strategic partnerships, incident response management, what else does that stand for, and more. Plus, he managed to turn the show into a drinking game. Seriously, it's Jennifer Weekly, number 186, Family Fisticuffs. Hello and welcome to Channel Pro Weekly, episode 186. My name is Matt Whitlock, technology editor, online director, and your host of this fine program for people like you. And who are you? Well, look in the mirror, and uh, I'm going to describe not maybe who exactly you are, but I can probably describe what you do. You're a VAR, you're an MSP, you're an IT integrator, you're an IT consultant, you're a system builder, you're, you do something along the lines of technology with other businesses. And if you don't do that, for example, if you, uh, if you are a Uber driver uh, as a full-time job, then this show might help you get a better job someday. So you definitely want to stick around and uh, learn and have some fun with us. This is where I would also usually say joining me each week is my uh, co-host, my awesome, talented executive editor friend here at Channel Pro, but he's not here. But that's okay. He's not lost. We do know where he is. He is on vacation, kicking back on a beach somewhere, uh, uh, some kind of drink in hand, soaking up the rays. Uh, although we do miss him. So it's just going to be uh, kind of me here and my guest uh, taking this show in whatever direction it's going to go. And without the voice of reason here, I have no idea where we're going to end up on the other side. But it's definitely going to be a wild ride. Uh, I am excited, though, that I have an awesome guest host with me this week. Um, he has over 30 years of business management and training experience in the computer electronics industries. He's owned several successful businesses, managed several successful IT and MSP service companies, and he's coached and mentored many more around the world. He's also the author of the book, Getting to the Next Level, a Blueprint for Taking You and Your Business to the Top. He's also a good friend and a heck of a nice guy. Please welcome Manuel Palachuk. Welcome, Manuel. Hey, thanks for having me again. Uh, especially as like in absence of Rich, I feel very graced to be you know your co-host. I think that's uh, it's very nice. I think it's I, awesome. I, when when Rich told me that uh, he was able to get you for this one, I I breathed a sigh of relief because I know you're just a, a super smart guy that can talk about anything, but you're oh, yeah. also a heck of a lot of fun. And then like <laughs> I was like, this is going to be great. And then I thought like this could really go off the rails, like yeah, yeah, really bad, but <laughs> it's going to be fun. It's going to be it's, special and it's going to be fun. It's going to be a good one. Uh, so I will do my best as we roll along here to put on my, my rich costume and try to talk about the news as best I can. Um, and we're, we're going to get to that in a minute, but first, um, Manuel, you've been on the show before. A lot of people know uh, uh, that, that listen or watch know a lot about you, but um, for those who may be new to the program, um, tell them about you and what you do. So uh, as you said, I've got actually well over 30 years of uh, experience in the IT and service delivery industry. And it's not just IT, it's actually, uh, um, my background is in electrical engineering and automated manufacturing. So I've worked in manufacturing plus all over North America, more than a hundred different companies. And so I've, I've always either been in IT or in electronics, uh, high tech, um, test and measurement equipment, things like that. And I just would, would vacillate between the two. And I would always get lured back to IT because of the money. And so, um, and, but service industry, probably the biggest thing I've been in service industry really since I've been nine, I delivered newspapers when I was a kid, right? I learned service delivery a long, long time ago. Um, but yeah, I have clients all over the world. I, uh, I build myself as the coach that will take you to the gym, not just send you there because I am a very hands-on approach and I don't really work with people who aren't on their way somewhere. You know, I don't just, I don't work, I don't just take people's money and say, yeah, I, I'll coach you. You know, so I, I have kind of a reputation for that. And uh, that's where you and I differ. I will just take anybody's money who they give. Well, you me. know, I will say there are a lot of folks out there that do what I do that will take anybody's money. And I ain't one of them. One really cool thing that I have that no other coach in this space has, I think I have now nine of my clients that I've put on the cover of Channel Pro, including this month's Skylar Jones, uh, one of my clients now for five years, he's on the cover of Channel Pro. And what I do is I, I help my clients create success and then I help them share their story with their success with others through your uh, peer-to-peer -peer, um, spotlight that you do every month. And uh, that's the last, I think, two and a half or three years, I put 10 people on the cover. And so that's, that's what I do and that's who I am. You have an uncanny record of uh, making people successful. I will say that and uh, helping you know, them get noticed. 
I, I think it's a good thing. And I think, I know that it, it's all good for them too. I mean, you know, I tell one of my clients and you get that, you get, you take that and you share that with your peers, you share that with your clients. That's, you know, I mean, you guys, you know, it's not something you can buy into getting on the cover. Like, at least it's, if it is, I've never paid, right? It's always, <laughs> you got to have a story worth telling. And that takes time to have, you know, uh, successful companies are the ones that, that have something to share. And I think it's a really, I think it's a really good thing. Agreed. I, you, you, so one of the things that you, that you teach and you coach about is this concept of agile service delivery. We've talked a little bit about it on the show in the past, but tell us, tell us what agile service delivery means and how that helps people be successful. So there's two kinds of agile, as I've said before, the, there's, when you think about this big thing, this body of knowledge called information technology infrastructure library or ITIL, they talk about agile, it's more hold your hand, sing kumbaya. If you think I talk to a programmer, they talk about it's little increments of how you build a software program, little bits at a time, and then pretty soon it's a full program. And it's just taking that same concept, not the hold your hands, you know, hold hands, sing kumbaya, it's that taking little components and building a thing, frequent releases of a usable product taking the same concept and applying it to the service delivery, where we look at a client service call to go out on site, that's a sprint. Uh, that's a, it's a sprint of service for the client where we go out, we just do a certain amount of things and then get out of there. We go look at a group of things that need to be fixed for multiple clients across that solves a problem. We call that a sprint. And it's just taking some of those same mindsets and methodologies and applying it to the service process. But mostly I would say it's also about not doing what's called stack and run, which is pushing the work on the text, which is a lot of the PSAs will say, yeah, every ticket has to be assigned or every ticket has to be scheduled or it's going to get forgotten or get neglected. But in Agile, we want to pull work and we take, we build up a team to be more a highly reliable and accountable team and then show them how to pull work from the stack as fast as they can. And that pull methodology, that team will, will cut through more work than the team that has having the work pushed on them. And so it's push versus pull and it's, it's, um, you know, it's right sizing the amount of work to get done to get, because, you know, a lot of clients will, or a lot of techs, uh, tech companies will go, we have to go out to the client, we have to do everything that they need done today. Like, no, go do a reasonable amount of work to get the most important things done. Then go back again, go back again and interleave it with other things that you could do for other clients and other things. And it's, so it's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. There's a big component of, of, um, assessment with that. It, it, I, and I've heard you talk about this before. And I know even for our events this year, you're doing kind of a, a crash course on agile service delivery. And um, well, actually, no, that's on that's on agile as applied to the business strategy, which is the other. That's what my book is about. It's actually taking the same kind of concepts, but applying them to the business strategy. That's what the five the sessions that we're doing for Channel Pro are. Right. OK, business strategy. But but assessment as a part of it is is I've heard you talk about being able to like look look at uh, to, to set goals and to work towards small chunks, achieve them, and then reassess and reset new goals. Is that a big part yeah. of that strategy? Yeah, I mean, it, it's at the heart of Agile, by definition, when you think of that, they say it's, it's continuous incremental improvement through frequent releases or iterations. So whether it's business strategy or service delivery, everything we're doing for the customer, we're trying to get their IT infrastructure in a better shape, taken care of, managed and then we do projects for them and we're continuously incrementally getting them to the next level like everything that we do that's really what it is in our business the it company the other side of it is our strategy is to always help our our own business get to the next level so our business strategy is the same thing we're going to do this thing in marketing and get incrementally to, to the next level incrementally in service delivery in uh you know whatever aspect uh, marketing and finance you know or marketing or sales or whatever and so it's just, for, so really at the end of the day, when people say, what do I, what are my main focuses of what I do? Agile service delivery, uh, the service delivery process that is the machine, the money-making machine, an agile business strategy, development and execution, which is the, the plan. So there's the, the plan and the action, right? <laughs> and, and so tell us tell a little bit about the, the, the course you're kind of doing with our events over the next six months on the business strategy, how you're presenting that, um, What's a, what's a good overview and why would somebody want to come and check that out? What are they going to learn? In one sentence, a really straightforward, easy to understand and easy to follow 
um, business strategy life cycle methodology. It's it's four it's four quadrants. Uh, assess your business, develop a strategy, execute on the strategy, and then you're back to assess what what why, what went wrong, what do we need to change, and then learning to do that as a habit every business quarter. So the way it's implemented, the way it's being um, presented is the first session we did, and I think it's going to be available for people to view or they can, they'll be able to see it like until the series is complete, you can go back and watch the first one, which was done for the first Channel Pro. It was considered Channel Pro. What was the first one? What the Channel was- Forum Midwest. It was our Chicago Midwest. live so show it was Midwest that was forced Forum. online. Yeah. So I basically gave the big overview picture of what the business strategy life cycle looks like, that, which I just told you, the four areas. And just I literally just mentioned a little bit about it. The next five are going to be, I'm going to deep dive into each. When I say deep dive, but deeper than I did, I'm going to spend 40 minutes with each of those four um, strategy life cycle quadrants of assessment, development, execution, and then back to assessment. Um, And the last one, I'm actually going to do a thing that kind of helps tie it all together and set you up for success, which is called the seven predictors of success. And it's basically saying, okay, you got the tool now. Here's some incentive for you to kind of look at who makes it and really makes it to the next level and who really, you know, um, launches. And it's the people that execute and the people that have all these other, you know, these other predictors in line that help de- basically determine how successful they're going to be. And what we've done is so there's six, the, the Channel Pro Tour is six, uh, six events. One's already happened. Five more to go, and you're going to get each of the other five, you know, components of this laid out. But they're all additive, and each one stands on its own. So, like you, if you didn't see the first one, you watch the second one. You're going to, I'm going to give a really quick recap. You'll, you'll be like, okay, great. This is assessing the business. All, all good. Stands on its own. If you don't see the, the fourth one, uh, business strategy execution, it stands on its own. I'll give you a little quick review of how we got here, but it stands on its own, and it's all about executing on your strategy. So. They're each modular, they're each standalone, but they all link together. And if you follow the tour, whether it's physically or virtually over the next six months, you basically get a view of, you get a a tangible, usable, executable, you know, a business strategy life cycle, you know, that if you adopt it, I promise you it'll lead you in the right direction. Yeah, and the next uh, one of those events is actually coming up here in a, in a few weeks. It's June 9th uh, in the Dallas area. It, we are confirmed that event is going to happen in person and it will be available virtually uh, at the same time. So if, you, uh, yeah. if you're unable to uh, actually go and physically come meet us in person, you're welcome to join us online. But uh, if you're in the Dallas area and you want to meet Mr. Palachuk and myself and uh, Mr. Rich Freeman will also be there. You're going to get a lot out of it, and I highly encourage. Um, Joel crew going to be there. Joel going to be there, and, and Daisy and Catherine. And- the the whole crew, the whole Channel Pro crew, uh, minus Lisa is not going to be able to go, but uh, okay. uh, the whole Channel Pro crew is going to be there. So yeah. come out. We want to meet you. We want to shake hands and then yeah, wash I, our hands. I just, I'd love to. I can't wait. It's going to be first time I've traveled. I think in a year and a half. You know, for outside of outside of everything I've either driven driven to and I haven't even left the state. I think I haven't, I, I crossed it once and that's it, the, the short way. You know? Yeah, I, this is the first time I've traveled for work since the last time we were in Dallas yeah, doing yeah. our show at the beginning of 2020. So yeah. uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to get out yeah. on the road and meet people again. Um, we'll have lots of hand sanitizer there so you can shake hands but then <laughs> you can come off as soon as you're, as soon as you're done. Um, so Manuel, you, you're always a fascinating person to me because you have you have so many varied interests and you have a lot of hobbies. And there, every time we have a, a conversation, a discussion, I'm always just blown away by some other new factoid you give me that like something that you do and uh, you're like an expert in. So, um, and, and a lot of it has to do with your background in electrical engineering and manufacturing. So you're very good with machines. Right. And I was I like the other day when we were doing the, our last event and you were talking, you were like, oh, yeah, I got this boat that I'm basically restoring and like you've yeah. rebuilt the engine and yeah. and it's like a big boat. Tell us about that. Yeah. So we call it a refit. Um, basically, it's a 38 year old boat that was originally designed for the Great Lakes region. It's a, called a Bayfield is the name of the company. They're out of business. 
but they built a very solid boat that they call it a blue water boat because although it's meant for the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes can get some pretty rough water. And a lot of people that buy them, they move them right out of Canada, get out into the Atlantic or they come down the, the Great Waterway down into uh, New, through New Orleans and they take them, circumnavigate the world. So it's uh, 45 feet end to end, but as a boat length, they call it 40 feet. And it's, it's a small apartment on the inside. It'll sleep six and it's got a, a kitchen, a galley. It's got a full size shower and a head or a bathroom and um, air conditioner, you know, refrigerator, um, I, you know, and it's, it's basically, you could just go live on it, right? You could sail it. You, if you got the skill and, uh, and uh, whatever else, you could sail this thing around the world and you can just go hop from port to port, you know, whatever you want to do. And uh, yeah, I bought it. Um, what well, it's called a depressed sail and a uh, motor didn't run. It was froze. It was like a rusted brick. And so I just tore it apart. And funny thing is 700 pound motor. And I pulled it out of the gangway, turned it upside down, completely disassembled it, pressed in new cylinders all by myself inside the boat. It never left the boat. And I literally took, I just basically used a cross beam and a chain hoist and, you know, just kind of like, knowing how to move mechanical things. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's kind of makes me feel good because I've never done it before, but I also went at it like, I know how to do this. I can do this. No problem. Right. And then, uh, uh, I spent because of COVID, I couldn't find parts. That was a pain in the ass, but I finally got all the parts. Finally got the thing holy all put back together and having trouble getting it to start. I went down on my birthday this year in February and on my birthday, I fired that motor up for the first time and it ran. And it was kind of nice because, you know, you put $5,000 into a motor, right? You spend nine, 10, 11 months, almost 12 months rebuilding it. And you don't know, you have no idea it's going to run, but there's no reason it shouldn't because basically you've rebuilt it and it's all to spec, right? So anyway, so once we got the motor going, we were doing all kinds of other stuff, uh, cleaning out the bilge, the you know, at the bottom of the boat where somebody spills something, it goes into this thing called the bilge. It's just a deep compartment and there's oil and muck. We like, we took like 135 gallons of greasy, oily, just um, environmentally deadly stuff out and took it to the recycle place and then pressure washed it, cleaned it and painted it. And, uh, you know, pulled, I, I got pictures. I haven't, I haven't put enough pictures out. I'm Michael Sigan was asking, he said, you got a website. And I said, yeah, but I haven't kept it up to date. I'm too busy working on the boat, but I probably got a thousand pictures. So I've got pictures of us literally pulling the tanks up out of the belly of the boat and sealing, resealing the fuel tank and the water tank. We pulled all the wiring out of the control panel. Like there was just like a rat's nest, right? And then I'm like, all that. Oh, sorry. About that. <laughs> I'm like, we're going to yard all that shit out of there, right? Next picture I've got is there's just like four wires. It's all gone, right? There, problem solved, right? So I'm going to redo the wiring. Uh, we're almost done with the water. Uh, just ordered re the refrigerator and the air conditioner. We got a brand new stove. I'm going to come together in the next couple of months. And, uh, you know, and I offer, I said, right, when you were talking about it, I said, I said, you should come down. You can come down and stay. And you said, oh, yeah, I got to get away from the wife. And I thought, you know, I, I meant you and your wife and your kids could come down. And you're like, <laughs> right off, you're like, I just got to get away from the wife and kids. <laughs> Uh, I should mention to him, I, I was thinking you could bring your wife, you know, I mean, you know, you're, well, I'm you're okay thinking, with that, but I've been stuck at home for a year with my kids. Right. For, like, you're like, I'm going to go down and drink school, with so. Manny. Fuck it. Right? <laughs> I would like that. So, so do you think that this project of doing this boat, and there was also like a wall you had to, I'm, I'm, I'm oh going God. to the two questions, <laughs> but there was like a wall that needed to get redone, right? So on a boat, you have what's called a head, a toilet. And it's not conventional. It doesn't pump and move and do things like a regular toilet. It's not just a reservoir of water that flushes it through and it's gone. You can't discharge it into the water. It's illegal if you're inside of like a certain, like two or three or four miles off. And it's environmentally not responsible to do anyway. So when you use the toilet, you use a pump or there's a, a electric pump and it pumps from a, either raw water or fresh water, it pumps it into a holding tank. And the holding tank is made out of aluminum 40 years ago. And it's sealed in behind what's called a bulkhead or a wall at the front of the boat, which is underneath this thing called the anchor locker. So here's this bow of the boat and there's a compartment and there's anchors and a generator, a gen set, a 
um, AC generator for emergency or for backup power. And underneath it is this aluminum tank that failed. And when I say failed, like I, you couldn't see it, but you could smell it. That stuff was getting into the bilge. You know, again, where where if things leak and they go, you're like, that ain't good, right? And then there's signs on the wall that it's soft wood and stuff like that. And there was a pump that had failed, and the tank failed. So I'm looking around and they're thinking, I think this is not good. You know, we got cockroaches and stuff like that. Right? So at one point, I start to tear it apart, and I literally put my hand through the wall. It was so soft wood, and I'm like, ah. Oh. I literally had to remove the entire wall from top to bottom in the front of the boat behind the holding tank. And, and then the deck where the anchor locker sat, I had to remove all of that because half of it was rotted to get to an aluminum tank. And then I had to cut a hole in the top of the boat where the hatches are. I had to cut this cross beam to get the tank out and then ordered a new plastic one. But basically once we did that, we pressure washed it again. And then we, we bug bombed it like we put, <laughs> I think we did a we did a double whammy roach bomb, like close the whole thing up, pop off the bomb, get the hell out of the boat, close it all up, come back a couple of days later, did a few things, clean up. I popped off another bomb, come back another three days later. And, you know, we killed everything off, but then I had to rebuild it. So I ordered a new tank, dropped it in the hole, built the bracing and everything, built the anchor locker floor, put in this new wall and... You know, basically uh, all, all new holding tank, all new hoses, all new wiring, all new toilet, all new wall. And um, it, it's kind of funny because like you had said, it's, to me, I don't think about it as a big deal because I used I worked at a boatyard for years. My background in electronics or mechanics is like, there's none of this that's beyond me. I used to, you know, do fiberglass work. So for me, it's a lot of fun, but it's really kind of getting on my nerves that it's been almost a year and a half and I haven't taken this boat out to sail yet, right? I'm, it's a lot of work, no doubt. It, so do you think is. without the pandemic, do you think this would have even happened? Not like this, no, I'd probably still be working on it for another year. I've been afforded extra time because like everything's kind of, you know, all the travel that I would be doing would have interrupted. I So instead I've been, you know, I go down to the boat for a weekend instead of flying to wherever, you know, that kind of thing. So it's actually afforded me more time to get stuff done. I, I'd probably, probably wouldn't sail until my next birthday, next February, right? Um, but as it is now, by, by this, like in a matter of a couple of months here, we're gonna be, we'll be able to just hop on it, grab our lunch, uh, uh, you know, some food and go down to Napa or Naples or, or uh, Gables, you know, Coral Gables or whatever in, in Southern Florida and, or, you know, no problem. Like, but yeah. Uh, um, but it's also been kind of weird because of the supply chain, right? Uh, in March and April last year, I couldn't get parts for the motor. So everything was in slow motion, which caused me to go, well, I guess I'll go ahead and get started on that. Let me go ahead and get started on that. Well, I'll go ahead and get started on that. Now you got everything completely like, oh shit, we've torn this boat the f up. Sorry. <laughs> we're going to make this a drinking game. My Matt, we're going to make it a drinking game. Okay. Every time I say that, somebody's going to take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so we basically tore the boat up and then it's like, well, I, I can't, I can't put in the refrigerator unit until I fix that. And I can't fix that till I've got that put back together. So pretty soon you're like, okay, you're in project mode, right? This is, you know, we were just going to get the motor going and see how things went. And then we found out that the head is the bulkhead is done. And while we're waiting on parts for that, we went ahead and checked out the air conditioner and that doesn't work. So we tore it out and then it, pretty soon you got this whole thing torn out and we're just literally coming out now full circle to getting, you know, we have no more rotted, broken or things that need to be demolished or removed. We only have things that have to get, be finished installing, painting or replacing. Is, does that make sense? Right. We're, right. And That's it's exciting it's stuff. Side. It's exciting yeah. stuff, and I, and I, I um, hope that you get a nice big bottle of champagne that's good and smash it on the side to christen it in, and um, and hopefully I can get some get a few pictures to put here in the video. So hopefully while you were talking about, oh yeah, we, we oh got yeah, some pictures that we were overlaying. Um, so I'll, yeah. I'll hopefully get those from you. Yeah, you know I get you a picture of the motor before, like this rusted old thing, and then the motor done. It's like you'd think it was a new boat. The bulkhead, I'll say, get you a picture of that. It's uh that th that would be a very stark contrast because it's. It's, it's amazing, you know, and then, and then I get your picture of the outside of the boat, what she looks like on the outside. 
So. Awesome. Yeah. I hope I uh, can't hope we get to share yeah. that with and everybody. Funny, here you asked me about it, but I, I get excited because I love, I love that boat and I, <laughs> I can't wait to take it out, but it's, uh, I can't wait to see it in person myself, which I, I do plan on doing someday for and sure. And you can bring your wife down. You don't have to. All right. I'll, that, I'll bring them. I'm, I'm just bring. saying, and your kids, <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> we'll see. I don't know if I'll bring the kids along. Uh, sometimes you need a break from them, but we'll see. I don't anyway, know if I love them that much. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, well, we, we do have more uh, to talk about here on, on the podcast other than just boating, uh, right. even though we could change the name of the podcast for today to, you know, boating channel, bro, boating weekly or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but we've got a few stories to talk about. It's kind of a slow news week. Um, uh, Rich is not here, so, but we got a few things we'll talk about. So Pulseway is in the news. Um, uh, we're going to talk about Robin Robin's events, a couple of interesting things out of that. I want to get your, your take on uh, Manuel. We're going to talk a little bit about breaking into new technology with partners. We're going to talk about incident response management. That'll be an interesting one. And we're going to talk about the 2021 vendors on the Vanguard. Also got a little game we'll play with you uh, on the other side of the break. So uh, lots of cool stuff. Stick around. And we are going to dive in and get this. This uh, I, was, I was going to say show rolling, but we'll say we'll get the motorboat running and the sails open. <laughs> and let's hit the water, right? Um, so the first story it actually hit the site uh, right after we, we recorded our uh, show last week. And that was, uh, that was Pulseway was adding Siri voice commands to their RMM solutions. So, um, so right now you can, with their um, uh, managed, server, managed services software, you can now uh, use this new capability to have technicians who run Pulseway software um, power off workstations, run scripts, apply patches, and using Siri voice commands. Um, I, what they say is that it's designed to kind of keep users who are like driving a car, doing something where they can't interact or hold their phone, that they can still initiate these these programs. Um, you can you can put these pro voice commands in individual vices. You can define groups. It's supposed to ask you for confirmation of these uh, uh, commands that you're giving, so that way you know it doesn't do the wrong thing. Um, so that's kind of an interesting one. I wanted to get your take on that manual, but they also added a new update uh, that launched some network management software to do uh, discovery scans faster and enhance functionality. Um, and they all introducing a retooled engine for its remote control solution that's supposedly three times faster than its pre predecessor. Uh, it allows you to transfer files using the Windows clipboard and says that some of this stuff is going to be rolling out over the next month. Um, so manual I, updates are always good to pulse away stuff. What I was going to ask you though, that I found interesting is what is the, what, is it a good idea if you're an MSP to start allowing your customers stuff to be controlled via voice command through a, one of these big tech companies who seem to be getting their claws into everything yeah, so here's the funny thing. The, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with no. <laughs> um, I, I get that we've got to move technology, and it's wonderful that you know we want to we want to see that the the world of tomorrow that we saw when we were kids on TV become true, where somebody says, you know, uh, the Jetsons. You know, he talks to the dishwasher, he talks to the maid. You know, she's a robot, and the things just happen, and that's cool. But then there's a reality of perception. Like this is this is the same as when you've got a real Siri and you tell it to play one song, and the name of that song is close enough to the name of another song, and it plays the other song. Okay, this is a real thing. Okay, humans have misunderstandings in communications and speech because they're all built on a language, and the and then and they don't really look for accents and all those other things that can come into play, right? So here in America, let's say, let's take somebody who's a tech down in New Orleans, has a bit of a Creole accent to him, and they try to tell this thing to do something. The chances, A, that they're gonna get it to work are already low enough, but that they're gonna get it to do the right thing is, I just, I'm again, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say no, <laughs> and then, and then, and that's without the mischievous side of things where people want to, they're bad people who want to do bad things. And, and I can't even imagine all the ways they're going to try and exploit this. Because at the end of the day, what is a voice command that Siri receives? It's turned into digital. What is digital? Digital is a signal 
that can be duplicated, hacked, recreated, reconstructed, changed. So all you really have to do is figure out where the weak point in there is, whether it's the microphone, at the microphone, at the device, you know, because we, we think about from a background in electronics, I go, first thing you do is you hack that mic, right? If I hack the mic, I own, I own. It doesn't even matter what you said. It will do what I said. And it will say, beep, got your command executing, and that server goes down, right? I, I, I get where they're going with it, but if I were an MSP, I wouldn't let this do <laughs> all. I mean, I wouldn't even let this anywhere near the servers for anything other than, hell, I wouldn't even use, I wouldn't even let it use it for a password reset, you know? I mean, God. It, it, it does seem it idea. does seem dangerous. I, I think this is the tip of the iceberg because if they're introducing, you know, Siri level voice control over your infrastructure, uh, it'll be extended to Amazon in the next update. And we get into, uh, my so my, my fear here is there are certainly security implications, but it's another th another layer of access and control we're exposing to some of these just gig companies that are just gigantic and growing beyond beyond um, all expectation and giving them more data, more and more control. Is is there any danger in there, or do we trust these these three big companies to not do any harm given so much access? Well, here's the deal. I we're going to because it's the hubris of man that we can we can control this and that it'll be okay and it will be the downfall i mean at the end of the day um like you said you know apple siri virtual assistant so if if, if apple got hacked really bad which would they do spend the majority of their efforts internally to cover it up or spend the majority of their uh, public relations to expose themselves and say, we're sorry, we screwed this up. It's a for-profit company. It's a big, they've got a lot, billions to lose. I'm not saying they cover it up, but they've got a choice. And so you're going to go and bank that that company, like you say, is going to have the responsibility. So what's the problem is society will be okay with it but the individuals won't. Like me and you were like, yeah, I don't think I'd do that. But at the end of the day, society's okay with it. We're just going to do it. Like, oh, everybody else is doing it. It's going to be okay, right? I don't think that, yeah, I don't think these companies should have that kind of power because look, look at what's going on right now with the hacks that are going on. You know, we know uh, uh, Russian-based companies or, you know, cells or whatever you want to call them are actively trying to get into are everything they can in America and probably other countries. They're, they're probably working on China just as well, right? Uh, Solar Winds being a victim uh, of that of those kind of hacks, which, by the way, the Russians. Last I heard, I was listening to an article. They were saying the Russians are saying, "Well, we actually think it's the federal government, in the U.S. We're building in back doors, and they got caught at it." Right? All of that is real. Like, doesn't matter who's really doing it. Doesn't matter who's the victim. Doesn't matter who the culprit is. You're going to tell me that these companies, Google, Apple, are absolutely impervious? The answer is no. And at the end of the day, when it goes bad, I think it's going to go really, really bad. And Well, that's interesting you say that, because if you look at it from a security perspective, is it, is, is it introducing another another method of attacking your customer base oh, you're giving them you, a whole that you have yeah. no ability to secure? Yeah, you're giving, you're literally, you're literally signing up and here, take care of that for me. You're literally, I don't want to say outsourcing was the proper term. You're, they are the surrogate now, right? Of your, your security. And, and, but that's what I'm saying. Society is going to go, oh, it's Apple. It's Google. It's Microsoft. It's whatever. The last freaking person I'd, Microsoft? I don't think so. <laughs> right. <laughs> but Society will go, oh, no, they're a big company. They're okay. They're responsible. I like their product. Okay. It'll certainly be interesting to see. So I, I, I'm glad I could get your take on that. And uh, folks, for, for those who want to learn more about these um, stories that we're going to be talking about, we for every episode, we put a show sheet up on shellpointnetwork.com that's got links to all of these stories. So you can go and you can read the details because I kind of skimmed through it and just give you the highlights so we can talk about it here. But there's always more detail.
I, you know, um, I gotta say, I do gotta say one last thing about this. I gotta tell you that the people that are Pulseway, they've got a responsibility to see to it that the infrastructure security levels of who can and who can't, what levels of script can and can't be done. Can you imagine the complexity of that? Like that's to me really is one of the big things is like, this is like, you need big data neural network stuff to, to see to it that the, the, the that it, I, I, yeah, it, it's just a labyrinth of opportunity for, for somebody who's hacking to me. That's just. Yeah, I, on the surface, I'm kind of with you. I, I'm, I'm not on the, I think I would go that route, especially, especially like so early on. I don't know. We'll watch, we'll watch this trend because yeah. I'm sure if they're going to do it, it's going to be, it, <coughs> we're going to see more of it. And then we'll just kind of have to see how that, uh, how that plays yeah. out down the road. Uh, we got one other news story to talk about, and and we're not we're not going to talk a, a lot about it, but uh, a lot of people uh, in the in industry look to Robin Robbins for marketing advice and marketing um, solutions and support, uh, and and follow her and do a lot of the things that uh, she says, and uh, as they should. She she's got great programs and she's a, a very smart lady, awesome stuff. Uh, she had her event that took place uh, on between May 11th and 14th. It was the 14th annual IT sales and marketing boot camp. Uh, looked like it was a, a success. There's two things in the story that I want to talk about, and uh, and go to the go to the uh, the website, folks, and pull up the link for this. Or if you're on YouTube, um, you can open up the description area. We got links in here, and you can get a, a recap of everything that happened. But there's two things. One, she she introduced a a year long program that's called the Celebrity Authority Trust, and it's intended to help position MSPs as well known trusted authorities. It carries about a $30,000 price tag uh, where they'll um, teach you all of this kind of stuff to create, create like an origin story and professional photos and kind of turn you into a, a, a quasi celebrity. Manuel, as someone who coaches uh, people, I, the, the reason why I wanted to get your take is because you, you are a business coach. How important is this type of marketing and branding towards becoming successful to you? Um, I think that a, a certain amount of it is absolutely critical for you to build your base and your client following and uh, be identified in your target market. Um, and I think that if you want growth, it should be built without question. Uh, you know, most of these things, they should absolutely be built. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, when I talk to my clients, well, like having one of my clients show up on the cover of Channel Pro because I help them create success and they share their success. That's a that's a thing that you should, at the very beginning, I said, you should tell your clients about that. You should share that with people in the community. That helps boost your credibility and, and all of those things. And, and uh, um, you know, being involved, also as well as being involved in community, you know, all of those things. I think it's very important. I don't know that it's required. There are many companies I've worked with who literally have just gained market share because they have momentum in a vertical and they have word of mouth advertising that is done amazingly. And it's surprisingly shallow pool, but a broad reach. And they've built in very large businesses off of that. Um, yeah, but you know, all of what, you know, when I read the article, all of those things are things that a company should be striving for. I mean, I would say in one way or another to make a nice, robust presentation of them, of their company. I think there's a few things missing from it, but. Interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting. It's good. It, good to get your take on that. There was also one other thing out of this event that I wanted to chat about briefly. And that is um, some of the statements that they made about uh, the pandemic and and some of the businesses that have come out of this on the on the other side more successful and and I know I mean, you know, I think you're I think you're a proponent of, of making sure that marketing is a part of every business's plan because if you're not marketing you know you're not generating leads but what she's saying is is a lot of the companies that really achieved a lot of success in this uh, climate that we've had over the last year the ones that invested heavily in marketing and promotion is do you kind of feel that way too that if you're if you're in a position like this that that is the the right approach to grow well, okay, so one of my favorite uh, management strat and business strategy wizards, high level, you know, mentor wizards, P 
Peter Drucker says there are only two primary functions of a business. Uh, you know, marketing and innovation. And innovation is largely given to us. I've said this many times before, you know, Intel tells us what we're gonna do for technology on processors. Microsoft tells us what we're gonna do for operating system. Like in a way, you're, you're, it really, you know, it's not a huge pool of things to pick from our technology and the innovation is largely done for us. They tell us what's the new thing and we just go, we either just go move and implement it. So the implementations or the innovation's easy. Marketing being the other one, you've gotta be constantly marketing. Otherwise you are gonna be falling behind and you're not attracting the new clientele. People don't know who you are. So yeah, I mean, marketing is, it's, it's half, I think it's half of what you do. I think um, one of the statistics I've seen at various places, service leadership and others, where they talk about the MSPs and IT service providers in this industry, if you're not spending at least seven or 8% of your, or your top line revenue, on marketing, that means that if you've got a hundred thousand dollars, literally your one person operation, hundred thousand dollars a year, you're not spending seven thousand dollars a year. You're not going to get to where you're going, right? Now you got to spend it wisely for it to actually do you any good. If you're a five million dollar company, right? Um, wow, right? That's that's you know, a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, what is it? Uh, Three hundred and you know, 50 some thousand and 70 some thousand a year. So yeah, marketing is very important. But remember that is your business out to for massive growth or are you just like, there are people who build businesses, perfectly good businesses that are family owned that just chug along and they don't grow fast, but they're very solid. They're very sound. They will be here in 20 and 30 years. Then there are companies who go, oh man, I'm going to make it rich. I'm going to sell this thing off, right? And there are a lot, I think there's a lot of people out there that entities that perpetuate, oh, you want to grow your business as fast as you can. As, you know, you want to be a, I call it a bottle rocket. You're going to it's, pop and you're going to go cash in. Hey, that's what everybody's got in mind. And I think there's too much of that going on in, in this industry right now is, well, I want to grow this business really big and then I'm going to sell it off to somebody or whatever, make, make it rich. Oh, okay. So do you want to build something lasting or do you want to build something to cash in? And the marketing for one is different than the other. I want to build something lasting. Well, you got to be marketing, but you don't have to be in your face, fantastic, you know, bold statements, everything. You just have to be there when they need you and be a solid name they can trust. And that, that money goes a long ways in a horizontal fashion out. Again, community uh, services, uh, um, the things that we support in the community and the things we talk about that we do for our clients. And then there's the bottle rocket. You know, we're better than anybody else and we can do it faster than anybody else. And we're the greatest. We have the best team. And, you know, just all of that kind of like take, take the, hy the hypo meter and tilt it like this and put your money in it and see where you're where it goes. And, you know, so it really depends on what you're up, what you're up to, but for no matter what the business is, yeah, marketing is, I mean, it's, it's very important. It sounds like it. I was also wondering when you, while you were talking there, if you take a solid business and you immerse it in water for like a year, would that make it a soggy business? So, well, no, but it may be solvent. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, how but to make, that could be a book, how to make a solvent business. I could, I, I love that. We need we need to work on that one together. Co-authored, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, anyway, I just think, but you do got to be careful where you put your money in your marketing. And it's funny because there's somebody out there every day that will help you with your marketing yeah. and your marketing budget. Yes, right? lots of lots of people, myself included. If you want marketing help, uh, come to me and with write a big check. I'll <laughs> I'll think of something. <laughs> We'll come yep. up with a mailer or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I love it. Um, good stuff. I think we're going to move on uh, from the news. That's kind of all we got this week. But we've got uh, some really interesting stories that have hit the site. Um, our, our May issue of the Channel Pro Magazine uh, is out. We're starting to get a lot of those stories up on, on the website now. And uh, one of them, uh, our next story is actually by uh, Skylar Jones, who you mentioned earlier at the top of the show, one of your, yeah. one of your clients. And he wrote a piece for us called Breaking into New Technology with Partners. 
I, I thought it would be a fascinating read. Uh, the the general highlights is is that when you're when you're building out offerings around technologies and emerging markets, it requires a lot of expertise you may not have in house. So one way that you can you can break into new fields of tech and um, gain new customers is and grow is to to do that through partnerships. And um, Skyler kind of lays out kind of his thoughts on what he looks for in a partner when he's going to market. Uh, and he gives a couple bullet lists that they have high quality product, that they share a, a customer f- first philosophy, that there's synergy between the leadership um, and that they, you know, always share financial information when it comes to projects. Now that's his list. Yours might be different. And uh, Manuel, I'd be interested to get your take on what, uh, what you look for in, in a partnership. But he also goes on here to talk about some specific concrete examples about like the IoT space and how if, if something's not in his wheelhouse, you, you know, you can find somebody that you trust and, and dive in to do these new projects. And he gives lots of examples there. He also talks about working with peer groups, uh, which we've talked about a lot about lately on the show um, about some of the advantages of, of getting involved in peer groups and what you can get out of those. Yeah. Um, so, so Manuel, let me start with you and say, you know, he kind of gives his, his list of what he looks for in a partner. When you were, when you were do, in a, uh, doing an, an MSP business and an IT business back in the day, what, what were the things that you were looking for if you were partnering with somebody? So first I'm going to say this, Skylar is, um, remember he's one of my clients and he's been for, man, met him in 2004 at GFI Max in Orlando, I think like, and I think we've been working together almost that long. He is one of the smartest people I know He's very smart. The, his background, where he comes from, and he's he's got a dedication to this business and what he's doing, and a lot of what I won't say, you know, what he's doing is because of my advice, but with my guidance, it's helped him solidify how that what he's thinking is the right thing to do, and a lot of the stuff that he's done is, you know, we is we've developed it, and I've helped him say. Fend off the things that aren't in your wheelhouse. Go find strategic partnerships, and helped him keep that discipline to where the strategic partnerships he has now is what got him on the cover of Channel Pro. It really is, and you know, and the people that he works with now. So when so when I look back, what my the same thing I would tell any client is what I learned, and that is I look for people that that have the same mindset and integrity and values largely. I, I've never been able to successfully couple with and make a strategic partner of a company that d- didn't at least largely have the same values. And when I say something like we went, oh, I have this and this and this, what do you got? And they go, oh, we got this and this. Nah, fuck all that. No, no, we're not a t- you know, fit. Or, oh, no, that's a great match. Let's be a partner. It's you do business with them and you work on a project, you do a thing. You start to get a feel for how they treat their clients, how they treat their employees, how they look at the world, how they look at the community. The you know the um, Daniel Goldman in his book Focus, he talks about inner focus, us the company, outer focus, other companies around us, and then other focus meaning the world and everything else at large. And you find people that seem like they're wearing the same goggles you are. You know, maybe put it that way. And every time you listen to your gut and either don't partner with somebody because they're just not a match or do because it's a good coupling, it's always been successful. So it's really kind of hard to put the tangibles on it, but it starts with the values. It starts with their mindset on how, what they think customer service is, what they think quality products are. And, and it takes time. You, that doesn't, that's not, it's, you know, it doesn't happen like, oh, we meet up, oh, right, we're, we're going to get in business. It's going to be great. No, 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 no. Skyler built some of his, his best a relationship he's got is with a client, a company who provides a complimentary service that they do cameras and security stuff. And they saw that Skyler does the networking stuff, man, for years now, they've just been getting closer and closer. And there was one point where they, he was like, I, I'm wondering if we should meld businesses. And I said, no, don't do that. Like, stop it. Don't do that. Yeah. And it's one of the best things is because they're both getting stronger. Their partnerships getting stronger. They're learning to work together better. And, and they're really, they're both of the same mind. I know the other gentleman, I've met him and, and broke bread and, you know, and talk with him. And so, it, but to me, it starts with that. And after that, really then the strategic partnership is, I mean, to me, it's kind of like culture of a company. If you've got the values and all the other stuff in alignment, man, I don't know that they're, 
all the other stuff is really negotiable or or you know you know um up you know up for discussion so what's the so what what's the um the the other viewpoint of you can you, you can devise these strategic partnerships but you could also do it internally what are the what's the risk and reward thing rewards to think about about whether or not you want to you want to try to yeah. work with other companies or try to do it yourself. So I, I have a, everybody, there's other versions of this. My, I call it the core competency matrix. So let's say I'm, I'm Skylar, I'm looking at my business and I've got this list of core competencies required to take care of my own clientele, dentist office. So we know the dental software. Uh, we, they all use Microsoft software. So we use Microsoft Office 365 and all of those competencies. Then there's all the competencies to take care of my business. We use XYZ RMM, XYZ ticketing system, XYZ accounting. So there are all those tools. And then project management and you know, all these other things. And I list all these core competencies and I have a roster of my technicians, a vertical list of them. And I put X's and see who all knows what. We need a broad understanding of all of those core competencies across the team. And then when we find a new one that gets brought in, I don't know, X, Y, Z um, sniffing software for uh, security, you know, uh, pen testing. Okay, are we going to take that technology? And I know that's very narrow because it's, it's one piece of software. But let's say as the as the um, security as a service and security first concepts start to bleed in, are we going to own that? Are we going to put that all of that roster of things on our core competencies and learn them internally, or are we going to outsource them? And every company has to make that decision. So to me, that's what it looks like. And so when you weigh it, you go, how long will it take us to get a, a competent team with a high enough level of capability? We can, we can measure it in time and money and, and, and pain of, of action because there's only three of us versus a company that's got 22 versus a company that's got 55. A company that's got 55 goes, oh, no, no problem. Put it on the roster, set up the uh, quarterly roadmaps for the engineers and techs and the people, hire people, whatever it takes and build those core competencies, no problem. Company on the other scale, like three, four, five people, you know what, we're going to start learning this. It's going to take us three or four years before we have three people that have a high enough level of competency, partner with another company or outsource it. And, you know, that's kind of the, the dividing line in that, but it starts with a core competency matrix. So you can do a proper evaluation and have some idea what you're doing. And I guess there's no right or wrong either. I was, I was sitting there thinking how you talk about getting to the next level and it seems like growing your competency is one of the ways to get to the next level and do more it things is. internally. But it's also, there's also something to be said for staying lean though, right? Like there's- No, there is. Uh, um, um, again, Peter Drucker, I think is who said it. Like you focus on what your company does best and outsource or partner with somebody else for everything else. But as your company grows, you go, you know what, like you said, I mean, really it is. It, it, are we ready to do that? Does it make sense? And when you do your quarterly evaluations on the business strategy, you look at that and say, no, but you know what? We are gonna strive for that because it makes sense because it's so coupled. Like for example, I'm gonna use security again. The security component, I don't think any IT or managed service provider should be outsourcing security with any, they should be figuring out how to get it as a core competency inside the company. 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I might've said, yeah, have somebody else do all your pen testing and all this other stuff. You can do your basic assessments and keep, you know, keep the boundaries and the borders, but we, it was a different world, right? So time, time changes. The business has to continually mature. Also, if their business is getting more and more mature, it's kind of a requirement. So I think there's a, yeah, it, it, it depends on the company, but it also depends on what your vertical is. And uh, then that brings us full circle back to the strategic partnership. If you found a company that you've worked with for six, eight, 10 years, and you've developed these, it doesn't make sense to bring it in-house. As long as that company is as mature, is as stable, reliable, and they're a coupled partner, you know, you could go a long ways without ever bringing that competency in-house. In and so my last question is, I, I want to ask because you, you said that there was there was seemed like there was, this example that you gave there was a lot of synergies and I'm sure other companies get in positions with partnerships where they've been working with the same company for 
you know, part or partnered with them for years and years and years, and they're doing all these projects together. And there are other synergies. Why not? Why not merge them? Why not be one thing? What's the what's the the advantage and disadvantage of doing that? Because your advice was, ah, it's not a good idea. You're both growing together. Well, oh my God. Well, um, well, be, besides the the complexity of the my my favorite analogy is this: like, as a sailor, you got two ship's captains, pirates on the sea, running around making money, doing well at it. You meet up, right? Port Royal, Jamaica. And you start talking, you're having a beer. You're like, you know what? Well, you you're in Jamaica, make- you gotta have rum. Yeah, look, <laughs> well, you, you could have grog too. So, but I agree, you're right. So you're having some rum and you say, I could make a gaggle of money more if we teamed up and did this thing. Okay, let's go do it. Now you scare them out, we'll knock them down. Boom, right, we got, we got a plan. We're gonna figure this out. We'll, we'll make them believe they're gonna get away from us just to come into your arms and then we split the booty. Boom, it's a wonderful thing. Then you go, hey, well, we should merge and actually make, I'll be the admiral. No, you be the admiral. Wait, who's gonna be the admiral? Now all of a sudden you have a problem. How many, how many captains can any ship have? One. How many admirals can a fleet have? One. So you have two people who are both strong-minded, strong-willed, have the ability, have the following of their crew, and you're going to go merge these two and call it an, an armada or a, you know whatever, right? And you got to pick an owner. That's probably the first biggest problem that you're up against, because when it comes time, here's the problem. And I mentioned that I start with this in my book. Culture, the culture of a company comes from the top of the organization. So this company has its own culture. This company has its own culture. It comes from the captain and it works its way down and it's permeated all the way to the ground. And they're similar and they can get along, but they're not the same. So when you merge two companies, you're basically saying all of the guys over here, like, hey, you could come over here and hang out. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna sail with us for two weeks and they're gonna sail with me for two weeks and it's all gonna be good. It's not how it works, right? They got a different culture. That's not how we operate over here. That's not how we operate over here. And I know that, and I'm using this analogy, but you know, that's how it works. It's literally like saying, you know, um, anybody that's ever, you know, been divorced and tried to patch together a family of kids, that's a hard thing. I did it once myself, tried. And it's, it's the same. You're up against all of these things about culture coming from the top. Who's in charge? I'm going to go to, you know, mommy, mommy says it's okay. Daddy said it's not. Now mommy and daddy are going to have a fist fight, right? <laughs> All that. <laughs> so anyway, and then there's, then there's, then there's, then there's, okay, well, strategy. So we merge these two companies. What is our focus? What is our business strategy? This company is so different. You also a sudden need to have two strategies, not that you can't, but you're going to have to have, well, our, you know, like when you're an IT company, our professional services has a strategy for how they're going to uh, do projects and how we're going to get growth in the in the pro services and strategy side. And we have how we operate and they can have their own little sub strategy. Service delivery can have their own strategy. Marketing can have their own strategy. Sales can have their own strategy. Now you're going to basically add another component where we've got the IT side and, for example, the, you know, the security side. You've got to keep those in line. It's it's really hard, and it, I still think it all comes back down to the part where um, one one captain has to be able to say, "I'm willing to become the first mate," and truly be able to do that. And that's a hard thing. Uh, I'll give kudos to um, Gino Wickman in his book Traction, which I'm sure many of the folks have heard about. He says a good company has usually got uh, an innovator, the one that's got the ideas. And then they've got, I can't remember the term he uses, and then they've got the actuator, the person that goes and makes it happen. And um, so I will give credit to my brother, Carl, when I worked with him, he was the innovator and I was the actuator, right? He said, hey, we're going to do this thing called managed services back in the turn of like 2004. And I'm like, okay, you tell me how, what it is. You tell me how it works. I'll make it happen. And I was, I was the president of the company and he was the owner of the company. And if you have two people who can go, join together and go, okay, I think this business will run better with you at the helm and me at the nav station, right? Navigating, we, you could, it would be a wonderful thing. 
Skyler's situation was not that. There's no knowing that gentleman and knowing Skyler, it's not going to work. Is you're, neither of you is going to be cut, step down to this position or whatever, take the other role. And actually, neither of you are capable of that. Basically, they're both meant to be owners. And so I know that's a long, it's a long explanation, but it, it, it and, and it's also true that as long as I've done this, the number of companies I've seen where I talk to a little IT company or a smaller, you know, whatever company, and they go, yeah, I had a bad breakup with an old business partner. Like, oh, okay. I mean, there are a lot of those out there and it's because they, they thought they could do something that they were never going to be able to pull off, you know? Yeah. And I guess if you have a very successful partnership going and you're making lots of money to use another uh, nautical phrase, don't rock the boat. Uh, is, right. Is good advice. Well, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's why it's, that's why I love the term strategic partnering. And it's why I love doing what I do with people to help them, you know, identify those, find those. Cause it can be very strong and powerful. Skyler's grown his business more since he started that strategic partnership, not just because of you know me helping him with with you know his strategy and me pushing him with the service delivery. That's just that's what's going to happen anyway. But what they brought to to the table each together has made both of those companies much better off, much stronger, bigger pull, and they're not even do, they're not even doing proper marketing, right? Holy smokes! If they did proper marketing between the two of them they would just, they could, you know, the trajectory is very good. And every time I've seen it, you know, um, if you, you know, they, your business, I think is the same, whether it's an individual inside the company or the company as a whole partnering with others. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with someone. And these two are going to go far, right? They're going to go far. Very, very good. Um, yeah, excellent. I, I, I thank you for sharing all that insight. That's that's a lot of a lot to digest, and I, I'm sure a lot of well, you, those yeah, listening you hit, you and hearing are going to is... find that very very uh, useful. So uh, good. Well, let's move on uh, and let's go to our next story. So the next story that we're going to talk about is called incident response management. Now, Manuel, I think we're we're going to take a fun tack on this one. Um, and the way, let me tell you a little bit about how this story came about. So in our last. Um, uh, Channel Pro Cybersecurity Online Summit, we had a panel session where we had um, four uh, MSP kind of experts and we were talking about like, how do you, like, what are the things that you do when, you, um, when you're dealing with incident response? Like what's the important steps to take? And we, we asked them different questions and kind of went to see like what the first three or four things that they would do after X happened. So um, we, we, we asked each of them a different question. So um, this was uh, what we asked Corey Kirkendall. Corey Kirkendall was part of this. Corey Kirkendall, yeah. Yeah, Brian Weiss, um, uh, Michael Kokenauer, and Jason. Oh, his name's escaping me. I will think of it. Jason. Uh, Brian Weiss and yeah, I don't Jason know. Farron. Jason Farron uh, was on here. So uh, all good stuff. So what I was thinking that would be, might be fun is I'm going to ask you the same four questions that we asked them. Okay. Although we asked them like, what was like the first, you know, three things that you'll do or what was the first, what's the steps you're going to take? I'm just going to ask you to tell me like, what's the first thing you do? Okay. And then we'll see what you think would how, to get a little insight on like what you think is the best way to be. So you say it's a response plan. Let's say somebody logs in and they're, they get an alert that one of the client servers crypto locker is, is, is now crypto lockered or something like that. Right. So, so, the, so the, the, the questions will be like, you know, your customer just got hit. What's the first thing you do? And I, you can expand out a little bit um, on okay. kind of what, what would be your strategy, your plan tech for dealing with incident response. So here, I'll just ask you the first question and then I think you'll see where okay. we're going. Your customer just got hit by ransomware. What's the first thing Manuel Palachuk would do in that situation? Uh, I, I, I use the term stop time. Basically, you, you go put a team on to start collecting logs and capturing a moment in time as far back in history as you can. Our logs, like everything, you put a team on that. Basically, you basically are pres um, you're preserving the scene, right? And I mean, our systems, the client systems, because if we were infiltrated, we need to know. So you go, you know, and, and uh, yeah, basically stop time and take a snapshot. Stop you get time. started on. It's going to take a while. You get started on. You're collecting logs. You're 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 um, 
uh, you're, you're refreshing systems that they start a new log and grabbing the old one and start stacking those in a pile for, for rentings. Awesome. So you and Corey Kirkendall agree that that's an important step that is in his, uh, his answers that he gave was to, he didn't say it is stop time, but begin collecting evidence logs and understand the depth, isolating yeah. where the, where the threat vector came into place. He had some other things to add too. So worthwhile to go and see what, what Corey Kirkendall had to say. Great answer. All right, Manuel. Question number two, the attack wasn't just ransomware. They got into the client's database too. What do you do? So again, basically stop time. You get, first thing you got to do is communicate with the client. The database is going offline. Unless it's a critical medical or financial trading or something like that, you basically pause the servers, check the logs, but verify that you got your backups. Basically, you because the idea is you stop time. If you've paused the servers, you communicate with, call the client. We're going to stop this. We need you to know what's going on. Right? Pause the servers so that it no it doesn't continue to propagate if it if the virus has anything to do inside there, but also so that we're not feeding more data in that we have to redo when we do the restore. Because basically everything from last backup to now could be have to be recreated, right? Right. Very good. And of course, the first thing that Brian Weiss said when asked that question, verify backups. <laughs> so smart answer there. All right, let's go on to the next question who we asked, uh, this one we asked of Michael Kokonoer. This time you are the victim. Your RMM has been breached. What are your first three steps? Ah. I'll say maybe your first two steps, but you can give me three no. if you want. No, I'll give you the first three. This is gonna be easy. One, call the wife and tell her we're going to Tahiti finally. <laughs> two, pack my bags. And three, <laughs> go to Tahiti. <laughs> Is you're out of business. No, okay. So, um, <laughs> so really, again, it's the same kind of thing. It, we have to go offline. We have to stop time for us. Basically, basically, you get every communications. Get everybody on the team and say, stop what you're doing. Literally, unplug. We've got to take an assessment of what's going on and how far it is. And when I say unplug, I mean literally unplug your laptops. We've got to go get, create an air gap to reconnect to our, our workstations, our client machines in the old fashioned way or drive out there or whatever else it is. But if, you, if, if we really think it's the RMM, we basically got to go into each one of those, pull the agent or, or pause the service, uh, stop the service. And, and again, that's going to require an action plan, but basically stop time. Everybody unplugs from our systems, from our clients, and then we initiate the air gap connection, meaning we physically go out there, we get a new machine that can't have been infiltrated, we remote in, we disable the agents, stop at its point. And then, and then we go back to the beginning of start capturing logs and you know and everything else like that. And it's hard, a lot of people are, are afraid to do this. They go, that's a very drastic thing. Well, I'm sorry, but like th this, is a, this is a different world than it was you know, when I started computers, geez, I had to dial up and have a, my phone talk to another computer, right? That Those days are gone. This is, um, it's a ridiculous what can happen. And if it's not, if you don't, if you're not clear on what, you know, basically like I'm, I can't stop an entire business. Well, you can stop it or you can let it continue to crumble, right? Mm -hmm. This this is gangrene. Like th this will will destroy things, you know? Yeah, Michael Kokonor had a lot of some similar things to this, say there. Also, some very um, clear cut steps that one should take. I, I do love uh, your your attack that, well, if that happens, you're just done. Yeah, so we're going to do it as well. Go on vacation. Um, but he said, oh, no, I, uh, meant, I meant we're moving. I, not vacation. No, we're just moving. It's great. Empty the bank accounts. We're just, we're just going. <laughs> leaving the country. Just hang it all up. Uh, he yeah. did say, he did say a lot about securing RMM. And he said, bring in the experts, have your insurance company is at legal and PR as quickly as possible. Yeah. And he had a lot more to say. You'll have to go check the article for that. All right. So I think the best way to handle an incident response is um, to prepare in advance before one happens. So we asked um, Jason Farron, what are the best ways to prepare your customers and your employees for an incident before one occurs? So A, you have to know what your response plan is. You got to know what you're going to do. When, when I say stop time and you're going to do this, 
you're going to have that laid out and what it means in a narrative. It has to be communicated to the entire team so they know. And the funny thing is you actually have to run simulations. People don't do that. They're not willing to do it. It takes too much time. And um, there's a concept of um, in, in software development, Microsoft's been using it for years and uh, QuickBooks used it for years, uh, where they literally will take a certain group of, of clientele and they'll inject a problem to see how long it takes to get discovered and figured out. And it's, they call it extreme software development. You have to do the same thing where you literally put that thing in there and see some frontline tech watching the heads up board doing, oh, crypto locker? Nah, that can't be right, doink, doink, doink. In the same way we're fishing our clients to see that they will, you know, who's gonna open up that letter that says they want a gazillion dollars from a guy named whatever in some other third world country, right? So they had to get that money because they did in fact win it legitimately. I gotta open that email and I'll do whatever it takes to get that, including give crypto rock locker to my workstation, everybody in my office. You have to do the same thing to your clients or to your techs and, and engineers simulate the scenario. So build the plan, educate them on it, run, run the scenarios and, and see who see how well they, they fair up to it. Just like a fire drill or anything else, right? It's a great answer. And um, a little different than what we got from Jason Farron. So, but you guys are both on the same page on the very first thing that Jason Farron said, which is train, train, yeah. train. Yeah. Uh, and he goes on to tell, talk about some things, but you also mentioned some stuff that he didn't talk about too. So that's a very good answer. Interesting stuff, folks. If you want to see what the, the other four experts all said, hit channel for network.com, find the show sheet for episode 186. Or if you're watching on YouTube, open up that description area and hit that link. I think everyone will find a lot of benefit here. If you want to see, if you want to see the panel session um, and everything that was said, you can also catch the, um, the channel pro uh, online security summit that we did. It is available on demand. Is it video? Uh, yeah, it's available. Oh, okay. on, oh, on cool. demand. So yeah. people oh, can go God, check yeah. that out. I think you'll get a lot more out of that. Yeah. Yeah, check that out. And um, uh, you can hit events.channelfornetwork.com and has us up for ways on how you can get to that event on demand. Very cool stuff. Um, I mean, Manuel, we're rolling right along. We've, we've, we've covered a lot of stuff. We do have a story that, that I wanted to touch, touch on today, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to tease it now. And I think we're going to talk about it next week. And that is um, our annual 2021 Vendors on the Vanguard story. So every year, uh, Rich Freeman and the team kind of comes up with uh, vendors that are kind of up and coming, new in the market, have new things to offer, and our companies to watch uh, in the year ahead. And I think uh, in the interest of time and in the interest of, I think it would be best if we had Rich here to talk a lot about more of these in depth because he knows a lot of these companies and why they're on the list in, in the way and some of the interesting things they do. I think I'm going to tease that, check that story out on the website. It just hit the website this week and we will, and then come back uh, to Channel Pro Weekly next week and we will make sure that we, we talk about that particular story. With that, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll be on the other side with Manuel Palchuk. I got a fun game for us to play and we'll wrap up the show with some oh, regular- Oh, that wasn't it? Oh, good, okay, great. <laughs> that wasn't it. We've got more, we got more fun ahead. Uh, I got a museum pick for you this week. And of course, we'll uh, break down with what's going on. So we will be, <laughs> right. you're killing me, Manuel. We will be right back. And we are back with part two slash three. Usually our end of the show features are part three, but uh, we don't have any, uh, an interview this week. So our part two will be wrapping up the uh, show here with some with a fun game I'm going to play with Manuel Palchuk and uh, some regular end of the show features that we normally do. So uh, Manuel, glad to have you back on the other side. Still still happy to be here. Oh yeah, no, I, I love doing this. Yeah, <laughs> time's flying. Like you said, this is, uh, it's quick and it's fun. It, time has has gone by much quicker yeah. than I expected, so uh, we'll try to we'll try to keep uh, the rest of this uh, a little tighter than than normal. But I got a fun game I came up with because it was just you and me, and I didn't want to play five questions because I didn't want to just make up five questions. I think we played five questions with you before, yeah. so yeah, I've got a, I've got a new game, and I'm calling it. What else does that stand for? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I am, I, as people know, I am like infatuated with the amount of acronyms that the IT industry has. Like oh everybody God. knows all of these different acronyms. And there's, I think there's more in our business than any other business out there, but all industries and, and fields have their own acronyms. And <clears throat> oddly enough, a lot of them overlap. So uh, I'm going to give you an IT industry acronym and a clue 
and I'm going to see if you can figure out what else it stands for. Are you ready? Yeah, you know, with all the different, you know, background I have in various things, I, I got to tell you, I could probably, I could probably do well if there was a big enough list of these. I'd play for money. <laughs> well, well, we'll we'll find out. <laughs> we'll we'll find out. There's because there's there's a lot uh, yeah. out there as it seems, but I'll try to I'll try to give you good clues. Okay. All right. So the first the first uh, acronym is MSP, which as we all know in our business stands for managed services provider. But if you were uh, an unlawful person in the state of Michigan, you might think it stands for this. <laughs> unlawful what? An unlawful person in the state of Michigan, you might think it stands for this. And you might be afraid of it. Uh, uh, a Michigan suspect person, suspected person? Well, you, why, but you'd be afraid of it. You'd be afraid of seeing these three letters. What might that stand for? Oh, Maybe Michigan State pa pa Patrol. Yeah. Okay. Michigan yeah. State yeah. Police. Right. Yeah. Very good. Very good. All right. Yeah. Or Maryland, uh, I guess, or. Yeah, I, I could be, could be any M state. That's the one that I looked up, uh, right. which was a thing. <laughs> it starts with MI and the only <laughs> other, oh, Massachusetts. Why didn't Massachusetts come up first? Good, good question. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, some of these had some of these had like fifty different things to pick from. I picked. Yeah. Them. Right. <laughs> all right. Um, the next one is RAM, as we all know in our industry. RAM stands for Random Access Memory. It's a computer component. But if you're in in into chemistry, RAM stands for this. Uh, uh, DNA. It's a chemistry and physics. I don't know why it was yeah, just in um, chemistry, but I would also put physics on there. And I'm, and I'm using my RAM and it's not working. Uh, uh, random access, my, my RAM, um, give me a minute, R, uh, and I, I got nothing. Stands for relative atomic mass, relative atomic mass. Certainly one I've heard <laughs> and I understand and know that, but no, it's not one. Yeah. Okay. That one that came to the top of mind for, uh, for the IT, IT mind. All right, next one. Uh, let's do HDD, as we know in the IT industry, stands for a hard disk drive. But if you were into trucking, you would think that it means this. Uh, or machinery. You should know this one. This is a machinery one. Trucking, trucking, um, or any type of um, gas-powered machinery. So heavy-duty drive or high displacement drive. Um, um, trucking machinery. I'll say I'll, I'll give you another hint. If you were into engines, if you were into mm -hmm. engines. Uh, you're really close with the heavy duty. Stick on that one. Yeah, um, and it's not high, not heavy duty displacement, heavy duty drive. Uh, type um, of fuel. Last clue. Type of fuel. Uh, well, it's not nitrox. Uh, so, I, I, what kind of fuel? What kind of fuel do trucks use? Big semis. What kind of fuel? Do diesel. They use? Diesel. Heavy duty diesel. Heavy duty diesel. Okay. So like in the boat, we use marine diesel. I used to pump gas at a truck stop. We just called it diesel, right? We didn't know it was heavy <laughs> duty. Like, okay. Heavy duty diesel. It's a thing, apparently. There you go. All right. Okay. Um, heavy duty diesel. Not we'll that lightweight shit, right? <laughs> this, is, this is the heavy duty shit. Because you put that lightweight shit in the car. You keep that, right? It's my truck. You put the heavy duty shit in there. Uh, that's right. The heavy duty stuff. Exactly. All right. So we did MSP. Let's do another one along those lines. MSSP, which as we oh, all know, in our industry stands for uh, manages security services, managed security services provider. Uh, but if you are in the medical industry, it would stand for this. MSSP? MSSP. I don't know if you're going to get this one. <laughs> Medical surgeon for surgical plasty. <laughs> like, these are very good now. I feel bad now. I I was I thought I'd do better. No, I maybe All I right, need to so, be drunk. Maybe we like 
I should have drank for this. I'm gonna I'm gonna put together a, a list of like a hundred of these, and when we're in when we're in Dallas together in a few weeks, we'll, we'll oh my god, we'll have a little fun. Uh, but it would be you'd think you might think if you were into, in the medical world that it was a medical staff services professional. Damn, I know. Like I'll give you one. I'll give you one that I do think you'll get though. Uh, so in the IT industry, uh, when you see DB, you think database. database right. But if you're into football, you think this. Oh, uh, defensive back. Defensive back. Very good. Yeah. All right. Okay. Good job. All right. Next yeah. one, USB. If you're in IT and computers, you see USB. And in fact, if you're anybody who sees USB probably thinks of universal serial bus first. But if you're a farmer and you see USB, you might think this. If you're a farmer. Uh, and you see this USB. <laughs> if you get a letter from the USB, who's where is that letter coming from? <laughs> right. Um, so, well, U.S. Bureau, U.S. United States, U.S. Bank. Well, so I almost used one with U.S. Bank, by the way. Um, oh. I, I, that was on the list of this. I, I was gonna. One of my clues would have been the ticker symbol of U.S. Bank. But right. actually, if you're a farmer, you might be getting a letter from the United Soybean Board. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a thing too. Apparently, uh, we'll do. We'll do two more. We'll do two more. Oh, I got, okay. And then I got one for you. But yeah, okay, two more. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, two more. Let's see. Let's do. SAS soft. If you if you are in the IT industry and you hear and you see SAS, you're thinking software as a service. I, Rich should have been here for this one. Uh, but if you if you live in Seattle and you see SAS, you equate it with this. So let's see, uh, Seattle. Uh, agriculture, something or other service. Site Seattle. I used to, I spent some time in Seattle. Um, it's, it's, I'll give you a hint. Seattle. It's a school there. A school? It's a school. Seattle Architectural Association School? No. I, I'm going to give you that one just because it sounds like it could be a real thing and the letters match up. But I was actually thinking the Seattle Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is an actual school in Seattle. All right, last one, last one. Oh, okay. Um, an acronym that's been around for as long as computers have been been around. It's the CPU manual. Right. The CPU stands for the central processing unit. However, if you're working in a lab, you want to make sure you're wearing these. Uh, something or other protection uniform. Uh, um, you're working in a lab, you're wearing your little uh, bunny suit, but what do they call it? Uh, it's not a, they, nowadays they call it a personal protection device. Protection uniforms, what's the C stand for then? Hmm. So if you're working in the lab and you're working with harsh chemicals, you'd want to be wearing your chemical protective undergarments. Undergarments. <laughs> I would be wearing my overgarments and relying on that. And then if it got through that, I would also have the CPU. So I would have La know. a layered approach to skin yeah, security, like, right? So like, hey, you can't go in there. Do you have the right underwear? <laughs> yes, I do. Okay, I don't care what you're wearing on the outside, but you better have the right underwear because if you spill that shit, you're going to be sorry, right? I don't do lab work often, Manuel, but when I do, I do it. Exactly. <laughs> I, put on my, I put on my CPU. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. You said you had one for me. Oh my God. You're going to love this. I can't wait. Okay. The acronym is FAT. In computers, in the IT industry, FAT, file allocation table. Okay. Outside of that industry, in pretty much the entire world, and according to Manny, what does FAT stand for? I can't believe you're gonna make me bleep myself. Stands for all that. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the sad part. 
you have a score of 100 and I have a score of like 10% or something like one in, did I get even one? I got one and a half. Several, you got several, right? Those were hard. Like, cause I'm talking about like I, I had stuff about, you know, medical stuff that you probably didn't know about, but that's what makes it fun because, and all of these, by the way, like I pulled up the list for some of these and there it's an unending list of, of what these could stand for. There's a ton, like 50 different ones. So we might revisit some of these again. I hope you had fun playing the game. I hope all, all of you had, uh, I did, I actually going to add something to this fun. Anybody actually listens to this and they count. Remember I said early, like we can make this, a. uh, uh, we're gonna make this a, a, a drinking game. Every time I say, you know, <laughs> all that, or the keyword, <laughs> you're gonna to have to bleep it out. But if some, if you, when you go to bleep it, you track how many it is and don't tell anybody. And anybody that listens to this, they send me an email saying, this is how many they are. The first person to do that, I will give them a one of a kind exclusive <laughs> all that t-shirt. <laughs> so there you go. So now uh, there you go. We'll see if anybody catches on <laughs> and get a t-shirt. I have one of those t-shirts, by the way. It's a very nice. T-shirt. I know. Right. Yeah. Oh, you better. You could bring it. Right. Okay. I, I could bring it along for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're going to move on. That was fun. Hopefully we'll play that game again down the road with uh, with, with some other folks. <laughs> the drinking game or the or the acronym the game. The acronym game. And, <laughs> you know, we're, I'm all, we're always up for, for good drinking games here on Channel Per Weekly, I guess. But we're going to move on to our next segment. And that is our museum pick. We actually, it's been many weeks since we've done a museum pick because we're always running out of time. Um, and I've had one sitting here on my desk for like four weeks that I've been trying to get to. And it's a fun one. It's a fun one. So Manuel, I want you to think back to the year 2006, 2007. And I want you to think of the world of mobile devices at the time. And as we all know, smartphones um, have radically evolved, particularly since 2007 and are indispensable. They're ubiquitous, they're everywhere. They do everything. But there was a time when a smartphone was a very different kind of thing, but they did exist prior to the iPhone, which came out in 2007. And I have an interesting one that's from that time period uh, that we're gonna take a look at. So this is one of, not the last, but one of the last oh. um, smartphones pre the iPhone. There, there, were, uh, there was one other model after this one. Uh, and then basically this kind of smartphone just all stopped being man manufactured almost like, instantly yeah. overnight. So this is a Windows Mobile 6 device. With a, you see with a slide out camera. So yeah, those who are watching I, on YouTube, you're seeing a good picture of it here. Yeah, Laura loves that keyboard. Man, she, I, she could probably do 40 words a minute on that. I'm not shitting you. <laughs> yeah, I was I was pretty pretty good and proficient at it in, in the day with this, but this was a fun one. So this one came out in 2006, a little before the iPhone. And actually for for a while, this was a superior device to the iPhone. And I and I made some arguments at the time, primarily because the the first iPhone was um it was sleek, certainly sleek. I think capacitive touch was certainly the way to go, but there was no app capability. There was no extensibility on the iPhone, particularly until yeah. the, the iPhone oh. 3G. So I found the iPhone very limiting in the beginning, and I, I continued to use this for, for quite a long time. Um, but for those who had never used a Mo Windows Mobile 6 phone, it was kind of like a little pocket PC, but it operated and would work kind of like Windows 90, 98 at the time, I guess. It's very Windows 98 -ish. So it did lock up about every once a day, and then you'd have it to reboot uh, it. Well, you know what? Windows Mobile 5, I think, was kind of was that way. But actually, this one was actually quite good. It didn't really crash on, on you all that much. Uh, but it's a very small screen, as you can see. It was, uh, you know, lower than VGA quality. Had a very good email client uh, uh, in there as well. Um, uh, and, and, and it was extensible and had apps. Um, uh, you could you could get software. There wasn't a centralized store for Windows Mobile, so you'd have to like go to the various places on the <laughs> yeah. download stuff. And like sometimes you didn't know what you were downloading, but there was there was repository of decent uh, application and software. Had a web browser. The web was still kind of new back then. It wasn't um, as uh, as the internet wasn't optimized for mobile devices back in the day. We'll just we'll just yeah. say that. Well, among other um, things, yeah, yeah, among among other things. But it was a it was a pretty good context list. Had a nice calendar. It was it was very it was very PDA ish, not necessarily the price point mobile computer. What's that? What was the price point on that? Um. Well, this was kind of weird because this was back in the day when like you would sign contracts with providers and like they would give you. Deals. Oh, but, okay. So it was still. Yeah, I would say if if you were gonna buy it outright at the time, it was probably 
four hundred to five hundred dollars, which so, was a lot for a phone back then. Well, but it's still my, which is not so much a lot now because we've been trained to, but still four hundred dollars. I never paid four hundred dollars for a phone. I've always got you know the the deal where you you know you know you either get your phone for it's a three hundred dollar phone, but you get it for free. But at the end of the day, four hundred dollar phone is that's the same price of a phone, an average phone today. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I, I want to say, I, I think I spent $99 on this and then it was like right. a two-year contract or something yeah. like this. Oh, uh, yeah. But it was a very powerful device at the time. It did a lot. And um, it was kind of like the, the this is kind of like a, an homage to the last smart PDA type phones before the iPhone hit and really moved mobile devices in a very, very different uh, direction. Yeah. So now, did you ever have a phone like this or what, what were you rocking back in the day? Were you, were you a Palm guy? 2006? And yeah, in the 2005, 2006 era. Here's the funny thing. Um, I was still using a, a flip phone and uh, I really didn't like it as much as my Nokia. But, but I, having my background in electronics and technology, I was, I just thought it was all just shite. The technology was not like, I wasn't going to settle for that. Like, I'm not going to do that. That's just, it's such low resolution. It's such a, I, I was like, you know what? Just, I just need to make a phone call and I'm not even going to try and do this until it's seriously usable technology. And so I don't think I, yeah, 2000, only I, I went to Europe, I went to Europe in 2007 for like the summer came back and then I went, okay, I'll get a phone that's a, you know, like more like that. And, 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 and actually by then almost 2000 and end of 2007, really it, it changed quickly, right? By 2007, I think my, my phone actually had a screen that and functionality, it was a, a Motorola. So yeah, I was sad to think whatever you want. I was still using a flip phone and still, and still missing my Nokia that had no flip. Yeah, um, a lot of a lot of folks didn't have didn't even see, like skip the whole smart P. I, I like I like to call it like the PDA phone. Yeah, generation. my company would have paid for it. I just was like, I'm not I, I'm not going to spend my life staring at that little screen, hoping that this thing has this, like waiting. Like if I sit and stare at it long enough, a, a new app will show up that has some use. <laughs> that. Or all that. Sorry. It's its primary use was um, uh, email contact management, like a PDA type functionality. Yeah. And at the time of this one was in existence, the, the major competitors for this style of phone was like Palm had some Blackberry and then there yeah. was like the Windows mobile variety yeah, you know, varieties. I guess that's the thing is it, you know, thank you for reminding me in that era, if it, everybody was, to me, everybody was trying to get to where BlackBerry was. And I had a BlackBerry in the mid nineties and into the late nineties. And so when it came time and I no longer needed that or the company, I was I, I had a job working in the um, Department of Energy as a contractor and everybody had them and it was just a thing. And it was a wonderful thing. I guess, I, I guess that's why I had that gap of, look, if it's, it, it doesn't have any capability, can't actually do anything, I don't give a shit. You know, <laughs> and so if I'm not going to have the BlackBerry in my hand, I'll just just give me my freaking Nokia. Give me a goddamn shoe phone. I don't care. Right. I just I just need to make a phone call. get a phone call. I'm not going to try and craft an email with it again, though. My wife, she had her little flip up and, you know, she could have written, written a book on that thing. You know, awesome your, your tolerability for technology, you know, uh, <laughs> mine was low. <laughs> So, so that was then, and so I like to usually do a tech pick uh, most weeks, especially when I do a museum pick. When I like say that was then, this is now. And when I made this pick, it was like four weeks ago. But I still want to talk about it because uh, it kind of goes along with something that happened. I was, I would say, now about four weeks ago, four, four or five weeks, six weeks ago now, maybe. Um, but uh, we lost a competitor in the smartphone space. Uh, LG decided to pull out of making uh, smartphones. They wow! Lost, right, lost money on it. Right. It, amazing to think that a company like LG can't make money in smartphones. It's a, a market that is heavily well, dominated it, by, by two yeah, or three companies. I think they could have made money, but, and they had market share. Oh my God. They had market share. And it's just, hey, here, have some free market. What? And I'm sure people at Microsoft are like, yeah, like if we could have just held on, we just like, they probably by default might have collected half of that market. 
you know, by accident. And then they actually would have made money on that on their phone anyway. But yeah, so what's the pick? <laughs> so, so with LG gone, I, the one thing that I liked about having an LG in the, in the industry is that uh, they, they were in order to try to, to grow and capture market share, they were doing a lot of interesting things with phones, some form factors that like, I don't think maybe drew people, but at least they were doing something different. So the one that I wanted to pick, and if you, you can still get it, uh, if you go if you go looking for it, that might be a fun one if you want a pe an interesting device with piece of history, and that is this one. It's called the LG Wing, oh, and it wow. was it was interesting because it was two screens kind of on top of each other, and you could flip it over, and then it, it apps were optimized to leverage this kind of format and and some fun different ways. So you could have, for example, a video running on the top, and you could have the player controls at the bottom, so you could do stuff. There was um, some interesting enhancements to uh, the email client to leverage the extra screen, screen real estate. It was just a unique and interesting device um, that uh, I, th I thought was kind of fun. And they were, they were working on all kinds of wacky stuff at LG over the years. So if you want kind of a weird one to, to st stash away or use for a while that uh, has some interesting capabilities, the LG Wing, you can still find it out there today. But, but here's the thing, like um, we are, we're with, T-Mobile now, we used to be with Metro PCS, stands for Metro Pisa. So um, <laughs> the I saw some of these other phones and there is one uh, laptop I was looking at that had the main screen at like the 3600 by whatever resolution, Matt. But down above the keyboard, it has another display about as big as a cell phone or a little bit smaller. And the idea was that you could be watching the, the gamer. It's a, a HP's gamer. So you could be watching the game in first person here, but then down on the console, on the keyboard, you have another screen that would like show you all your tools and the, your, your weapons, or you could tell it to show you this, like all the score stuff instead of being overlaid and in your way, you could glance and see what's over to your left and stuff like that. And so I think that, I think that, that's going to be in the future a lot. I think that what you're going to see is, you know, my, you know, my just standard, whatever, LG K40 brick. I'm going to open it up and you're going to have a phone that's like, that's too wide and bottoms a keyboard. All of a sudden you can do your keyboard thing again. You know, some, there, I think that there, I think you're going to see more of that and whether they turn, you know, whether it does the wing thing or not. Um, I hope so. so. Now, when you turn it back, off. is it? LG showed off a rollable uh, that they were at CES this year that kind of like we was there, we're into the age of like flexible OLED displays and like the phone would like just kind of slide up and the screen would just magically get bigger, which was kind of cool. So hopefully we'll still see some innovation yeah. in, in those areas with uh, with less competition. But it's a bummer when you lose a competitor because you get a little less innovation and a little less competition. I got to tell you, it's still made. when you think about business strategy, they went, you know, they went, you know what? We they, they did, I don't think they cared about who's going to get the market share. They just said, you know what, what are we going to be good at? What do we want to make our money at? Cause I think they could, I know they, they were making money. They could make money. They just went, we could make more somewhere else. Right. And they just pulled in the skirts of their product line. Um, here's an odd thing. I was bothered me. I don't understand how, why in technology in the world, this has not been solved yet. And this is one that you might know of too. Nothing, nothing pisses me off on a phone more when I'm trying to send a text message and you're typing in your message or you're talking your message, doesn't matter. Why isn't there a freaking backspace? Why can't I backspace? I, can, I have to touch the cursor and put it where I want it. I'm sorry, not a backspace, a delete. I can backspace but I can't delete. I have to move, I have to get that little line to move to the other side of the letter. You're right, there is and no then delete hit backspace. button. How is there not a freaking delete? I, I think you're onto something and I think well, we're gonna have to- I can't be the only one, but you didn't know it was missing. I think your brain- I, No, no, I, you know, like I, I, I've noticed it's missing, I guess, just like everyone else, I've just gotten used to it, but it, having settled a delete key would be nice. Mediocrity. Even yeah. if it was like, even if it was like shift backspace. Oh my God, that, I take it. That Double would, tap. that would be, that'd be it. That would solve the problem right there.
Yeah, double tap, double quick tap, right? Of course, I haven't uh, tried to double quick tap. I wonder, no, I'm pretty sure it's still back. I think I'll just, just backspace. But yeah, right, come on, it's the 21st century and all the innovation and we haven't, like the keyboard layouts, they got figured out. They got all, they got it all. The only thing they don't have is a freaking delete key. And that's what I want. And when that shows up, we will have a party. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Well, so that's our museum pick this week. It was uh, the at t 8525, also known as the HTC Titan or the Hermes. Uh, it went by several names back in the day as carriers picked it up and rebranded it as their own. So wait, what do you got to pay for it now? What, what's going to cost me if I wanted to go find one of those? If I find one. What, what? Oh, I... Because no carrier, it. that's what I was going to say, by the way, uh, T-Mobile T and all those, they're not going to give me that phone. They, 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 they just, their stock is just disappearing, right? Where do you, you're going to get it on eBay or what are you going to do? An old, like an old one like this? No, no, the new one, the way. Oh, the way, no, you can still, you can still get them at, at uh, they're still in stock at a lot of vendors. They got to clear out inventory first. And LG said they're going to support it. I, I didn't look up the price. I, well, I think it's probably somewhere in the thousand dollar range, $700. Oh, wow. Might might be it might be a little less I don't know, um, yeah. but uh, fun one fun one. So check that out. That yeah. was the LG Wing 5G and my old museum pick, the AT&T 8525. Manual. Unfortunately, we're we're running out of time and we got to wrap it up. Um, uh, Rich is not here to do the in case you missed it, but James Gaskin every week po posts uh, uh, and in case you missed it up on ChapelNetwork.com. Make sure you go check that out and see what you might have missed. And Rich will be back uh, next week to well. Tell, tell us what he would have predicted and what would have came true if he tried to tell us what was coming up this <laughs> next week. Uh, Manuel Palachuk is my guest. Manuel, thank you so much for being on. I, I always love it when you're on. I think I think you and I did a respectable job today without him. I, I think we did. I think it's probably going to be one of the best shows that you've ever done. And uh, I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> and, I really you, appreciate it. <laughs> you made a lot of censoring work for me too, by the way, just so you know. I, I've got a lot of bleeps to add in. <laughs> oh, God. yeah. Again, drinking game, count them up. Count them up, folks. <laughs> the first person, send me that number. I'll send you a T-shirt. If you, but if you get the wrong number, f all that man, you got to. He's got to be the first person. That's the only one that gets it. So, Manuel, uh, if people wanted to learn a little bit more about you, get in touch with you. How how can they do that? Where where can they where can they find you? Well, if they can spell my name correctly, my website is manuelpalachuk.com. I'm also on all social media as slash Manuel Palachuk. So, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, Twit, um, Insta Spam, all of them, just slash manual palachuk. Awesome. I hope uh, people will get up there. And of course, the website is channel4network.com. Go there each and every day for the latest news, articles, resources, downloads, white papers, everything and anything you can think of that will help you make your business better. Make it your homepage. Uh, go there every single day, make it, make it a point. Channel 4 Network, uh, Channel 4 Weekly is the podcast. You'll find us and subscribe to us just about everywhere podcasts are found. Uh, so make sure you do that. If you like to watch, go to YouTube, we find our channel there, hit the subscribe button and the little bell and I don't know, whatever else Google makes you do now to get notifications about, about things that get posted on YouTube because it's always, always another step, it seems, but it's worth it. So do that and join us there as well. Do both, why not? Watch when you can, listen when you can. We, you want us everywhere you are, no matter what. Um, we're also on the socials, find us there, subscribe to us, uh, on all those, follow us, whatever you do, the people, things that people do on the socials, you want to do all that as well. It's important stuff. And with that, I'm going to say, uh, say, make sure you come back next week with, uh, for ch episode 187, Rich Freeman will be back and we'll have uh, another guest host and I believe an interview lined up for you next week. So things will kind of resume back to normal. Thank you all for watching and listening. And thank you again to Mr. Manuel Palachuk. And we will see you all next week.